Hello and welcome to Insight Germany. My guest today is a novelist who grew up in Kenya, studied in Britain, and came to live in Berlin in 2002. Priya Basel worked in, Lon in a London advertising agency before becoming a full-time writer. She's written three books so far, and she also co-founded something called Authors for Peace a couple of years ago, a platform for writers to use literature as a way of promoting peace. Welcome to the show. Um, you've written your novels here in Germany, but none of them are set in Germany. Why is that? Well, when I came to Germany, it was in sort of rather special circumstances. Um, I had studied literature and I had wanted to write, but um, I think I was intimidated after studying. I thought, what makes me think I can do that? And I sort of went sideways into advertising, thinking it would be creative and, you know, also a good career and just found myself increasingly miserable. And um, my partner, who's German, um, said to me, you're always talking about wanting to write. You're really unhappy. Why don't you come and spend some time in Berlin, try and write and see what happens? And so I had this amazing chance just to try and follow my dream. And I arrived in Germany, not speaking a word of German, not knowing anybody apart from Matti, my partner. And um, just with this story in my head, which was partly a story based on um, the journey of my family from India to East Africa to Great Britain. Um, so at that point, it didn't even enter my head that the place I was writing in might have some significance to the writing itself. What I did find, though, was that being relatively isolated here was actually ideal for writing. Um, because it gave me this kind of space for contemplation and um, aloneness that is necessary for writing. And is it easier to write about a place after you've let it, left it? Because you write, uh, your books are set in Kenya. So one of them, Ishka Mush, starts in India. Um, is it easier to write about things when you've left them? Is it, uh, have you got a very good memory? <laughs> I've actually got a terrible memory, I have to confess. <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> well, but I mean, the, the thing with writing fiction, of course, is that you don't need to rely on the uh, memory. Doesn't need to be absolute for you to use it. No. You can you can use impressions and sort of hazy um, reminiscences. Yeah, and but your writing is very descriptive. Yes, I mean, I, that's true. Reading it, I'm in there. I'm in India, or I'm in Kenya. Well, um. I think I would have been able to write about these places had I still been there. Um, it's just my fate that I've left the places um, where I, I lived and started. And um, maybe in that sense, they, they have a different pull on the imagination. I mean, for example, it's quite surprising to me that both my novels um, are partly set in Kenya because perhaps naively I thought, well, this was a nice place that I grew up, but actually, you know, it hasn't had that much influence on me. Um, really, I mean, now I feel like it's, it's, it's sort of crazy that I ever managed to delude myself that was the case, because of course it's formed me in so many ways. But it was only really when I started to write that um, this became clear to me that Kenya was a really important part um, of my life, informing my character, my political attitudes. Um, and so, in a sense, that distance, I guess, being away allowed me to see the place in a way that I wouldn't have seen it had I still been in it. And I think it gave me a critical distance because um, the second novel in particular is very um, critical about Kenya and the society and the corruption. Um, and that was something people there didn't like when it was reviewed. And I think I might not have seen those things or might not have had the courage to say them in the same way. Who, who, who didn't there. like it when it was reviewed? You mean in Kenya? In Kenya, oh, I see. yes, yeah. yeah. They yeah. were very, um, they were upset that, um, you know, who, who was I saying these things about their society? Um, and I think that, you know, this question of what you have the right, what you have the right to talk about, what legitimacy do you have, um, is something that can, be difficult um, as a writer. Uh, I, I always felt that I was writing about a place that was close to me and that I knew and therefore um, I could judge. Mm. Um, would it then in the future, with this in mind, would it be difficult to write perhaps about the society here because it's not so corrupt or 
I mean, <laughs> mm. perhaps it's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not just easy to write about things because they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, but uh, no, I think that you just start to have a different relationship with what you write about. I mean, at the moment, um, you know, what I'm writing isn't set in Kenya at all. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm coming slightly closer to Germany in the sense that I think a bit of it will be set in South Tyrol, so where they speak <laughs> German. So, you know, I can imagine the sort of evolution to where I am writing more about where I am, because um, you write about the things that interest you and that trouble you and yeah. that you want to understand more. And after a while, the past has, maybe you've grappled with the things that most, um, you know, had the biggest hold on you for a while. And then new things have to take their place. And that comes from the present. Now, you were born in London, but left when you were, I just said, one year old, spent your childhood in Kenya. But you come from an Asian background. So do you consider yourself British? If anybody asks me, um, you know, what are you, I, I would say, um, British, but um, you know, it's it's a it's something I say with a whole lot of qualifications because um, obviously the Indian aspect of my identity is very important. The fact that I grew up in Kenya and the fact that I now live in Germany means I think of myself more as a European as well. And um, so, it's nothing that I feel comfortable with. I mean, these kind of labels of identity. Mm, okay. I feel like there are so many different facets to the identity and I think the way that I feel most comfortable um, describing myself is by saying that I'm at home in the English language because I feel as though that somehow unites all my disparate worlds um, even Germany point. to some extent because people here have been so generous about speaking English that I was lazy for years about starting to learn German yeah yeah we've got a one or two pictures from your own personal archive and I think this is so sweet <laughs> do tell us about that well, this is a, a shot of my sister and I in Nairobi. Um, and I think it sort of sums up the relationship quite well, which is that I was Miss Bossy Boots and my sister... You're in yellow. Yeah, I'm in yellow. <laughs> and my sister, was, who's a year and a half younger than me, Seema, was my very willing follower and slave for... Oh. Um, until she was about eight, at which point I had a crisis when she suddenly decided she had her own mind and um, I was no longer going to call all the shots. I think it took me a very long time to get over, over that. I think somehow I still haven't quite, you know, yeah. got over the fact that I can't call all the shots all the time. <laughs> and another picture, this is of uh, the, the, well, three generations of your family and shows the diversity, I think. I mean, it's interesting you saying that you don't feel British, you're, the English language sort of describes you better. Tell us about the family a bit. Where, well, in the middle um, of the sofa are my grandparents, Mumji and Papaji. Papaji um, actually uh, died two months ago. And um, they, on either side of them, uh, one has my mother and um, their son, Neff, my uncle, and then um, my aunt and cousins. And I think it's really interesting. I, I chose this photo partly because um, some of the people who are in that photo are no longer there so either through death or through divorce or through separation and i think that's so interesting with families that there is this con this shifting sort of um yeah uh, arrangement of members and that's very normal these days even though you know for my grandparents it's still very upsetting that um you know their children and grandchildren get separated and divorced um and also because it shows um that you know my uncle for example married an english woman um, you see my sister and I in the background with her with her Scottish boyfriend, me with my German boyfriend. And so um, I love the way that this family has uh, really, in a sense, lived up to its, its roots because my grandparents moved and so they were wanderers. They were, they were adventurers in that sense. And we've kept up that tradition um, by wandering to me in terms of the way we love. So, you know, other people. And then I, I've continued to, by moving to Germany, continued a journey in a sense, mm. um, uh, the emigration journey. Do you feel you're settled here then now? Or do you think do you, think you have that wanderlust, as they say, uh, to move around? Um, I feel pretty settled. I'm still very curious, but um, I feel more settled here than I would have imagined possible. Um, if somebody had told me, you know, 15 years ago that I would end up living in a German city, 
with a, a German man, I, I, I would have really, I would have said, no, <laughs> that's not my destiny. Yeah. Um, and yet here I am. And I feel that this is, Berlin especially, is really um, a city that I feel very at home in. Um, I think it has everything I want from a big city. Uh, it's sort of culturally, it's so rich and um, it's got, you know, you could go to a different art exhibition every week and still not see everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet it's sort of calm and um, I feel it's a very humane place to live um, and I like that very much. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, the other day our reporter met up with Priya Basel and she took him to one of her favourite spots. It's very peaceful there and it's where many famous authors have found their final resting place. <laughs> For me, walking is part of writing. Every day, um, the walking part is as necessary as the writing. After I've written, I always go for a walk. It's sort of strange to me that, that I find this a pleasant experience because I'm sure if someone had told me that in some years' time you'll be walking in cemeteries every day, I would have thought, how strange, how morbid. But actually, I find it very serene, very peaceful. I love the fact that there aren't many people there. And um, I'm also very moved always lo looking at all these people who are gone but still remembered, the tombstones, the names. It must have been an author that he loved or something. That's kind of funny, my shadow on Bertolt Brecht, when it's actually the other way around and all these amazing writers are actually casting shadows over me as I write. What I didn't know was... No way. Uh, wait a second. No way. The International Literature Festival in Berlin has been a sort of key for me into Berlin's um, literary life. Uh, since I uh, met Ulrich Schreiber in 2010, um, I feel as though lots of doors opened into um, another world that I wasn't part of beforehand. That is so funny. That's great, isn't it? Is that... We have been inviting Priya for the last three years because she is an outstanding author. Her books are fabulous and she's dealing with very important subject of the contemporary world with uh, belief, with intercultural relations. And um, we feel gifted to know that she is living in Berlin. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now you can breathe. It's strange, actually, to be in a city where history is so potent and so loaded. Um, and I like it. I like it that I'm forced to reflect again and again. I like the way they're transparent as well, and so you sort of see yourself in them and then you see everybody else too, and the sense of continuity, that life goes on, we go on, and yet we still have to remember. Before we move on, if you'd like to a signed copy of one of my guest books. They're here. I'm framed by both books. The first one is Ishk and Mushk. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Perfect. Which translated would be Love and Smell. The second one is called The Obscure Logic of the Heart, this one here. Please write into us at insight at dw.de and include your postal address in case you're our lucky winner send it through the post, of course. You can also write in to comment on the show. We do like to hear from you. They were at the Berlin Wall Memorial. Obviously, um, I worked it out. I did the math. You were about 11 or 12 when the wall came down. Do, do you remember it at all? Do you, do you remember hearing about it? No, not at all. I think I was pretty cut off from that sort of stuff in, in Nairobi. Um, I mean, in, I must say that I lived in quite a bubble then. Um, it's surprising to consider it now, but um, it was a sort of small bubble of privilege. Um, my family was pretty wealthy and um, 
we didn't, I, I wasn't, I don't know, I mean, I didn't really notice of things that were going on around me that, you know, that so many people were so much poorer, that there was such obvious injustice. And I also wasn't so aware of what was happening in the wider world. Um, it was a very, a, an existence very rooted in where it was, with little sense of what else was happening in the world. Mm. That's obviously changed now here in Berlin. You said in, in the report, strange to be in a city where history is so potent and loaded. How does that affect you, this history? I mean, It's made me think very hard about what it is to um, be part of a history like the German history. Um, I mean, obviously, as in all British schools, the Third Reich is, you know, one of the main topics. Um, and so I, I knew about it, um, roughly. Um, and yet to be here and to see how people negotiate that history on a daily basis mm. um, has been really fascinating. I think that it's been done really sensitively and intelligently in Berlin. Um, and I guess they had that special chance because it became the capital um, quite late. There was a sense of, you know, rebuilding this place to reflect a lot of what had happened in Germany's history. Mm. Um, and I think you feel that the thought has gone into it. And yet it's discreet too, because it's not that you're sort of, it's in your face, all the time. I mean, if you think of the little cobblestones, for example, that that, that installation by a German artist. Oh, these are these. Which, the, oh, you mean the little things on the on the ground? Yes. All through. All the, through the city. Through the, the with city the names where of, Jewish people lived. But yes, and the yeah. names of those who were taken away. Yeah. You know, you could be walking along and not see them at all, and yet once in a while, for some reason, your eye will catch, and you'll look down, and you'll see these names, and you'll remember. And I like that sense of surprise that. Um, you know, you're sort of sometimes caught unaware and made to think a little bit more, but you can also go around doing what you normally do without always being conscious. So your attitude to, certainly from the time in Kenya where you say you're living in a bubble, um, what you think of Germans and, the Ger and Germany now is completely different, presumably. Yeah. yeah, and also there was a very active choice to be more aware of what's happening in the world um, uh, because it seemed to me that this this past um, indifference uh, was just not um, very good or very viable. Um, I want to be engaged, I want to know what's happening, and I want to also try and be part of things to influence things. Let's talk about writing and, and books, because this, this country, we, in, the, in the piece there, there was talk about the International Book Festival, which you're a part of. Um, in Leipzig, there's a huge book fair. In Frankfurt, there's a huge fair. Um, there's nothing comparable, I don't think, in Britain, really, is there, on such a scale? I mean, the Germans read, don't they, are, are, in a big way, and yes, buy books. Yes, absolutely. That's yeah. very true. And... Um, that's been, it's lovely to be a writer in a society that really values books and writers. I mean, I'm not saying they don't in the UK, but you're right that it's on a different scale here. And um, I think it's partly um, that writers have a different value still in German society. I think people look to writers um, as kind of maybe moral conscience of, of a society is quite, it's, I know it's quite a heavy way to say it, but I think they look to writers as, as models, as examples, and expect writers to sort of lead, um, you know, social issues, uh, lead on social issues and discussions. And, um, and that's something that I, I, I admire. Um, and I think you don't have to do that as a writer, but if you want to, there is a platform for that in Germany. In the UK, I mean, I hear people talk about their work and they might be asked, oh, um, did you want to make a point about, you know, the NHS in your book? And, and they would say, oh, no, no, I mean, that was just a sort of, you know, that happened by the by, but that wasn't really my intention. And people sort of downplay always um, the political aspect of their books. So it's just a very different sense of what a writer's role is in society. Mm. Now, you love people watching. Um, I know this because on your website there's a little film and you once followed a man because of the way he answered his phone. <laughs> I mean, writers, I accept, are observers, but are you nuts? Are you crazy? <laughs> a beautiful woman following a man through the streets. What, what happened? Well, I will admit to being a little bit crazy, and I think probably you need to be to, um, to, to write well. Um, because, I mean, that comes from a, a very deep curiosity about people. And um, I think my curiosity can sometimes be actually a bit of a liability too. 
um, because I, I get very caught up in people's lives, even people I don't know. You know, I found myself, I remember going to a party and meeting a woman who'd had a problem with her leg and she sort of talked a little bit about it. And we came home and I couldn't get her out of my head. And part of me wanted to Google to see what I could find out that might be able to help her. And I said to Mattie, you know, do you think I could get back in touch with her and tell her I found out this? So, I mean, which is sort of senseless and unproductive, but it just shows you a little bit of the way that the imagination works or mine works, which is that I get very caught up with little things about people. And then I sort of, that grows and grows in me. And mostly it's fine because I can channel it into my writing, but uh, sometimes it can just be a bit consuming in a not very, um, yeah, constructive way. Mm. I also get the impression you be strongly believe that write writing can change things in the world. Is this why you co-founded uh, uh, Authors for Peace? Um, that uh, when, in my second novel, The Obscure Logic of the Heart, um, I ended up writing a lot about the illegal arms trade. And um, I was very shocked by this um, and the fact, I mean, there is now, I think we're moving towards an internationally rounding um, arms trade treaty. But when I finished writing, I thought I want to be able to talk about political issues more, not just in my work. And um, yet, on what authority do, do I do that? From what platform, you know, as a new writer, you're not always given um, a chance to talk about what you believe in. And so I thought, let, let me do something where my voice can join with other voices so that our voices are amplified because they're together. And um, I was actually, I worked with um, the Literature Festival in Berlin, the festival director Ulrich Scheiber. He helped us to launch this platform. We started it with a, a, peace, a reading for peace um, in 2010 on International Peace Day. And 82 authors from around the world came together and read for 24 hours continuously from their works and made different statements about peace. And it was a very symbolic act, but um, that was fine because I think that, you know, actions start from symbolic um, movements. And, um, and since then, we've done a lot of different initiatives and, you know, the... Yeah, well, we've got one coming. My guest is the author Priya Basil, and not long ago, she marched on the government quarter here in Berlin with a number of other writers in a protest all about personal freedom. Writers marched on Berlin's chancellery this September to demand action over the ongoing NSA spy scandal. The group, among them many of Europe's leading literary lights, came armed with boxes full of signatures and an open letter, which they recited in unison outside the chancellery to scores of journalists. <laughs> the group hopes that their protest will highlight a situation they feel is out of control. They want Germany to take the lead on data protection and to tighten existing laws they claim are too lax. We want to make people aware that it's an important problem for our society in the 21st century. Do we really want to be observed by who knows who? We demand a response to all of these issues. The writer's actions come amid a global outcry over the breadth of the United States spying operations, revealed via information leaked by former CIA contractor Edward Snowden. Shortly after this protest, it emerged that German Chancellor Angela Merkel's personal phone had been tapped by the U.S. National Security Agency, prompting U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry to admit that intelligence gathering has gone too far. The writers agree and demand that Europe's leaders stand up and fight for personal freedoms they feel have been dangerously eroded. As was said there, shortly after that protest, we heard about Angela Merkel's personal phone being tapped. I mean, this the whole thing's really exploding now, isn't it? Absolutely. I thought it was quite interesting that Angela Merkel only really spoke up when it was her own phone that um, had been tapped. And we've been feeling that angry for quite a few months, Miss Merkel. Um, and, but I was glad that, you know, it sort of, it, it hit home in that regard. Um, I mean, when I compared the discussion in Germany to that in the UK, um, I'm really struck by how much louder it is here. And, um, and I feel really lucky to be part of a society where people are bothered and um, are taking action and are resisting, because I think this is such an important issue in terms of our personal freedom and our democracy. Uh, I think we often think of freedom as something that, you know, the ability to speak out in public or, or to do what you want. 
And um, <clears throat> we've forgotten that freedom is also the right to be private, to be unobserved. I mean, I think we can only be ourselves if there are spaces in which we are not observed. And what these revelations have shown us is that that space of privacy is really, really shrinking. And if we don't act now to, you know, try and stop that, um, then we, we're, we're reaching a point of society where there's total information control. Do you think it has something also here to do with, I mean, you weren't here, but there was, there was East Germany uh, until 1989 or 1990, actually. And there, everybody was being listened to and everybody was informing on everybody else. Do you think that's partially to, you know, the Germans are very aware of that? Absolutely. I think having a history like that certainly makes you much more sensitive. But I think sometimes the present is its own best messenger. And, you know, we don't all need very difficult histories to recognize that something really terrible is happening right now and that we have to act to stop it. Mm. Talking of the present then, is, has anything come out of that protest? Uh, well, I think that um, there is an ongoing discussion in the media. Um, I mean, that got a lot of attention. And since then, the revelations that have continued to come out means that the story is still is, uh, I think, spreading and catching more and more people. In terms of the writers, actually, um, there is an initiative going on right now. I'm not at liberty to say more about it, but um, I would say, you know, watch this space because we're not giving up. And uh, Is this Writers for Peace? Uh, well, or, me, or, or, as, or, me as Authors for Peace, um, involved, for peace uh, involved in an initiative okay. with um, other um, international writers, including Yuli Tse, um, and we're working on an initiative right now which uh, we'll be telling people more about um, in a few weeks. All right. All right. Let's move on to our wonderful questionnaire. I, I'd like to go... You, you responded to our questionnaire beautifully, I have to say, and I would like to ask you a few... Th Firstly, you put down as your top down, everybody puts down Berlin, and you did put that, but you also put Lübeck. Yes. Which is right in the north of the country. Why do you like Lubeck? So well, much? it's a lovely Hanseatic city. I mean, it's beautiful, just cobbled streets, lovely old churches, so it's really atmospheric. And um, I know Lubeck because that's my partner's hometown. And so it's where we end up going at least once or twice a year to visit his mom and family, exactly. Um, but I think it's very special also because it's, it was Thomas Mann's city. And oh, the great author. Yes, yes of course um, it was. So it has yes. these other resonances. Then Gunther Grass, the other great German writer, also um, was from Lübeck and I think still has a home there, mm. I think in the same street as my partner's mother. So um, it has all these lovely resonances, family, personal ones, but then also literary ones. Um, and so it's that, that's why I like it very much. And you put down as your coolest living German a little boy. Indeed. Do you remember? Tell yes. us about this little boy. This because little this boy. is all about multicultural yes. things here. Uh, he's called Surafel Loifer, and he's a little Ethiopian boy that my neighbors adopted two years ago. And um, I chose him as my coolest German because for me, he represents the future of Germany, a more multicultural future. Um, and when I first came and started spending time in Berlin um, 11 or 12 years ago, it was a less diverse city than it is now. And it makes me really happy when I walk through the streets now and I hear different voices and I still don't see as many different people. Um, but um, you hear lots of different European accents and, um, and languages and that's wonderful. And um, I think more and more I can imagine um, that changing to the point where we have actually lots of different people in Berlin. I know there are other German cities that are already much more multicultural, like Frankfurt, Stuttgart, I think even Munich. That was going to be my next question. What yeah, do you think? But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's really nice. But they're still not, it's still not like London. I mean, London is extraordinary when you go there and you just feel as though the world is here. And that's beautiful. I'm not saying that everywhere needs to be equally mixed because, you know, that's not an ideal. It's just, it's nice when it happens. Um, but I think that, you know, it's important for a society to be open to others. And, um, and Surafel represents for me this idea of an openness to a different kind of future, mm. yeah. Another one, useful German product, uh, is the fixed book price, which people most probably out there do not know about. So we should explain that to them. That, well, yes, yeah. the fixed book price. We don't have it in the UK. You still have it in Germany. It's fantastic, whereby books cannot be discounted 
um, beyond the agreed price. So you can't have this as you do in UK and American bookshops where you go in and, you know, it's three for two or, you know, the price slashed in supermarkets down to, you know, five pounds or five dollars for a book. Um, books are still pretty expensive in Germany. Um, but they are also um, have a very different value because of that. Yeah, and and I looked it up, I researched this. The Germans buy more books, actual books, yeah. per capita than any other country I know, in the world. I know, that's quite still, extraordinary. Even though they're not yeah. sort of slashed prices. Yes, know? yeah, because they love books. Um, yeah. I mean, you really feel that when you go to readings, you go to events. I, I mean, one funny thing is just the German stamina for listening at readings. You know, you have readings here that go on for half an hour, an author just reading, and people are very attentive. You know, in the UK, you never have a reading for more than five or ten minutes, and then there's chatter, and then maybe you read again. But just, I think just the attention span also says something about the attitude um, to reading and... Um, and yet the value again. Do you think their attention span generally for other things as well is better? I don't know that I can comment on that generally. Mm. Um, I think it's also a generational thing, isn't it? I think in different societies with the new media, I think we, we, we feel sometimes that, you know, younger people haven't got the same attention span because they're switching between things all the time. Um, but then again, the popularity of Harry Potter suggests even young people can read a long book. It's just if it has to be good and grab them. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to say that gen Germans are generally more no, concentrated. No, no. I just. I mean, I just wondered <laughs> off the top of my head. Ingenious German invention, energie vendor. Well, it's not really an invention, is it? I don't know. It, this is the energy transition away from nuclear. That's right. Yeah. I, I found this quite extraordinary because obviously with climate change, it's an issue around the world about how we, you know, um, have more sustainable energy. And I love the fact that in Germany, through this energie vendor movement, the people have taken control of the energy. So, I mean, at the moment, 25% of Germany's energy comes from renewables. And about 65% of that is made by the people, by the German population. And, um, and they expect that by 2050, 80% of Germany's energy will be from renewables. And meanwhile, this means that the hold of the power companies is really shrinking. And if you compare this to the UK right now, where power prices have gone up by 10 to 13 percent, you know, people have no control over it. Everybody's really unhappy. The company is making huge profits. And here, people make profit because they, can, they make their own energy and then they sell it back to the grid. And I think that's quite wonderful as, as an I, alternative. Do you think that amount will be in the hands of the people? In... Well, it is already. A significant chunk of the renewable energy is already. Yeah. And I mean, of course, there are still things to, to fix and the grid needs to be expanded, you know, different storage mechanisms. It's an ongoing process. But I think what has been shown is that the people can take care of their own energy needs with the right government incentives mm -hmm. and government support. And um, I mean, people now argue that, in fact, the only reason it's taking longer is because the government's trying to protect the energy company's interests. Um, so I, I, th I think of it as a wonderful example of a sort of, you know, grassroots movement where people have managed to take control of something that mattered to them. Because very often we feel as though we can't do anything, we can't change anything. But it's, it is possible, with the, as you can see, through mm. a movement like that. Have you, have you got solar panels on your roof? We don't have solar panels, but we do have our own energy production unit in the basement of our house. And um, we actually use gas to make energy, but we can also use wood pellets. Um, so it's not, it wouldn't be my first choice of energy um, sort of uh, production, but we, I live in a place where we voted on it and the majority wanted that. Yeah, well, we t I just show a picture. Another, this is another of your pictures. It doesn't look very exciting in itself, but no, it, I'm sure it was exciting it at the was, time. It, Tell us what. It was a very special, I mean, there's me in, in, in what finally became our apartment, sort of waving, uh, when it was still very much a construction site. Um, my partner and I became part of something called the Baugemeinschaft in uh, Germany, which... Uh, um, a building... Building cooperative? Cooperative, yeah. right. Yeah. And um, this is basically when like-minded people come together, they cut out the developer and they build their own place. Um, and we did this about um, seven or eight years ago. Mm. And, um, and we now live in this apartment block with eight other families. 
Um, and it's been a real surprise for me because it's like being part of a community in a way that I had only felt before with my family. Um, and it's also something that's helped me feel like I belong here a bit more. We talked about belonging before. This has been part of my sense of you know, being able to imagine staying on here. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll hear more about um, my guest's experience with a building cooperative in a minute. First of all, though, let's have a look at another similar project to explain it all, also here in Berlin. My guest is the author uh, Priya Basel, and uh, who you've had a similar experience to that, you know, a cooperative building a, a house. Now, you must, in this cooperative, have these meetings of all, all the... Have they been? How's the, mixing with how Germans like to do things and how you might like to do things? Yes. Uh, well, I th guess it would... I found it no different to um, perhaps meeting, you know, any big meeting um, between different people. Um, always some tensions, always slight difficulty. Um, but I think there was just a general... There was such a general wish to build a nice place for all of us to live, that that overrode most of the differences. Um, I mean, when we started the meetings, actually, I didn't speak very good German at all. I spoke very little German. And so that was kind of to my advantage, because I could just sort of, you know, blank out while they, they, when the discussions got more heated. <laughs> um, and it also meant that I wasn't that somehow attached to what was going on, because, um, you know, I hadn't been arguing for something and therefore feeling you know, I really want to make sure this, this goes through. Um, so in that sense, I was slightly protected from it. Um, now we have much less meetings, now that we're just a, a Wohngemeinschaft, a living community, um, maybe two a year. Mm. And, um, and they tend to be pretty, pretty easygoing, pretty nice. I think we're quite lucky. I, I know that there have been cooperatives where they've had a lot of problems, a lot of, you know, very difficult... Um, discussions that have stalled for ages because there could be no agreement. Um, sometimes I think the right bunch of people, we weren't so many that made it easier. We were all just really wanting to have a nice home. Mm. And, um, and it worked more simply than it has done for others. So do you feel this is home now? Yes, in yeah. a way. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine um, recently and she said something to me. She said, it's faces, not places, uh, which sounds a bit twee, but I felt like there was something very true in that. Um, that for me more and more, because my, my life and, and my loves are so spread out. I mean, my sister lives in Australia now, you know, my mom and my brother, my dad and my brother in Kenya, my mom's in the UK and my uncle and my grandmother too. And Matthew's here and some of my, the people I really care about are in Berlin now. And, and have I your family visited? here at all. Yes, they have, yeah. yeah. And I feel that where, where I see the faces I love, I, I do very quickly feel at home. And maybe I'm, I'm also lucky in the sense that they're all living in democratic open societies, which you mm. can go in and out of easily. Perhaps it will be different if they were in a more difficult environment. Um, but yeah, the faces um, make home. Yeah, that's true. Final thing you've said here, the best kept secret in Germany. Germans have a sense of humour. Did you believe they didn't before you came here? Though? Well, I mean, I'm, M Matty, my partner, is a very ironic, very funny person. And so I, I, I knew, I thought, OK, well, he, there must be something, maybe there's something more to the Germans. Um, but what I've found so funny being here is the political satire. I mean, there's one story I especially love, which was of this... Um, uh, a, 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 a German party called Die Partei and how they infiltrated the Liberals um, after the German local election in 2011. And they basically started cheering when the results came. So even though the Liberals actually hadn't even made the threshold, there were all these people in there cheering and saying, yes, we've done it, we've done it. And it was, I just thought that was such a funny way to sabotage a party. <laughs> And, um, yeah. They're very good on political satire. Yeah, we'll have are. to leave it there. Priya Basel, it's been tremendous talking to you. If Don't forget to write in for, if you would like one of her books signed, if you're a lucky winner. That's it from me. Until next week, bye-bye.